Welcome to the Instinctive Influencers Podcast, a show where influence becomes one of your tools for success. Now, here are your hosts, Brian Weber and Ed Haley. Hi, I'm Brian. And I am Ed. And this is the Instinctive Influencers Podcast. Hey, Ed, so it's been about a week since we did that last one, man. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you've uh, hit the task that we gave not only the audience, but also ourselves. So I did. I will be honest. Uh, when I did it, I just kind of did something from the article. I attempted some things, not any in particular one. But yeah, I did. I did. Uh, and I had an excellent opportunity for some of them because I was traveling. So um once you find somebody speaks English, you know, strike up a conversation. Yeah. So we'll get into that. But yeah, I, I did get a chance. Yeah, me too. You know, I, I I actually made it a point. I knocked out two different ones that I, I really kind of focused on. And uh, I just, I thought, well, you know what? Let me just make sure I do these. And I noticed a difference in my attitude in a sense also. And I think the people that were around me at the time probably realized I was paying a uh, great deal of attention to them. And and actually, so the main one time that I I can particularly remember this taking place was actually during our training meeting on Wednesday, which was kind of cool. So but so hey, so what do you I mean, what did you think about what you ac- tried to accomplish, man? So it was odd. So I was I was concentrating on accomplishing certain ones, but I also recognize that I do some of the other stuff without even thinking about it. So it's kind of a cheat for me, right? Like the first one, I think last week was what? Like bring yourself to the here and now. Well, I do the the meditation and the mindfulness practice uh, daily. So that's already a thing I've been working on. So I kind of cheat on that one. But I did did notice some stuff, especially kind of getting out of my own comfort zone and doing the, and discuss, having discussions with people. You know, using some of the active listening skills, like now to show you're listening, because you can kind of almost see somebody's ears perk up when you give that nod, like, oh, he's listening to me. And then they continue on. So, yeah, it, it, it was interesting. And I did notice some some things throughout the week. I would definitely say so. The two things I tried, uh, one of the things was, you know, set the devices on silent or put it out of sight type deal. So I was sitting there <laughs> and <laughs> I was in the meeting and I had set the phones face down on the table and I didn't really, I wasn't thinking about it right then. But then, and because I had them on silent, I did have them on silent, but my watch, it went off. And I caught myself trying to look at it. And I was like, wait a second, no. So I took my phones, I picked them up physically and set them down on the floor uh, to make sure I didn't you know, get interrupted. Now, I still had the watch on, but the sleeve of my uniform kind of covered it over. So I purposely, you know, like I forced myself. And it is a little bit weird, though, because you know how many times we've talked about Simon Sinek and what he has to say when it comes to like, we, we kind of live for that, that buzz ding bleep the comments anything like that and yeah. i was just like i kind of felt a little bit anxious like i wanted to see what it was or who it was um and well coming to find out it was my wife she was just sending me some cute information about my kids which i always love those but um uh, but i i forced myself through the entire tim and i didn't look at it until i get to the very end of the meeting it was over uh and then i finally looked at my stuff now the other one that i found I felt more difficult to do. Like I felt that that was more difficult than playing than having the phone there was avoid fidgeting. Like, I really didn't realize how often you remember if you remember correctly when we went through the academy they told us not to play with pens and stuff like that, not to twirl them, not to you know, not to fidget. Yep. Yeah. And I did not realize how much I twirl a pen throughout the day when I'm talking to someone. Like literally right now I'm twirling a pen in my fingers. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just That's- <laughs> it's insane, isn't it, man? Yeah, and it, so it's funny because uh, so my fidgeting is doodling. So I wrote down, literally, I wrote on a piece of paper, phone and fidgeting. So, you know, I got some notes of what you're you're saying. And then I started drawing a little, like, stuff around the fidgeting. And <laughs> um, Are you so, saying you're not listening to me? <sighs> no. Come on, no, Ed. I'm not. No, I did listen. That's how I got phone <laughs> and fidgeting. Uh, what I did have done, right? Uh, on this episode and on our earlier attempt at this episode is I concentrated on what you're saying and 
my cell phone is not even in the room. So if the, you know, if I get a call text, whatever, I know you don't have that option with your position, but mine, I do. So that's something I'm actually using on the recording of the podcast to try to uh, be better, have a better presence uh, on the show. So hopefully our listeners pick up on this. (laughs) Oh yeah. When you say call text, what do you mean? Call text. So nobody can call me, nobody can text me because my phone is downstairs. Like I don't even have it in the room with me. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, see, I'm actually I use the internet through my phone, yeah. and I'm <laughs> actually in my my office, like my work office, to record this because I figured, hey, man, this the acoustics in this room are amazing. So uh, I'm not going to get echo or anything like that. Plus, I had some work to do today, so I was like, well, you know what? I'll wait till Ed gets up and. Once he gets up, I'll get to rolling. But yeah, so my phone actually is behind me, but I put it on vibrate. So I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, anything. I mean, obviously in my position, I kind of have to pick things up if it's an emergency, but most of the time it's not an emergency. And I have some really good senior non-commission officers who know how to take care of stuff when I, I'm not able to. So, hey, you know, something I noticed I did today too. Uh, I was at the gym. I was talking to a guy after I got done working out and he we were talking about uh, one of the opens that we're doing. And I didn't know how to do uh, it's something called double unders, the jump roping, like where you jump and you have to get it twice. Yeah. I'm not very good at it. I mean, I'm really bad at it. Like every time I like strike the back of my legs and I'm going to have welt marks after a while, I pretty, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to pick his brain about like techniques he used to learn how to do it. And I found myself doing exactly uh, what the sequence is that we were given. Uh, that sequence about, you know, when you're talking to somebody, uh, they finish their sentence, your face absorbs, your face reacts, and then only then you answer. So I, I, w- I actually tried to do that. Like I was actually trying to be mindful in doing that. And I felt myself, um, I, th- I felt myself watching him also doing the same thing back, almost like he was mimicking me. So to me, when I think about these things, man, uh, and, and those of you who don't know what we talked about, go back to last episode. If this is your first episode, go back to last episode and then come back to this one. Maybe you know that whole presence or the charisma thing, I think it can be mirrored by people and you can almost uh, kind of you know, like transfer that you know, subliminally in a sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it does too. So cool. I find myself, um, you know, if I do find myself not, nodding when somebody's talking not giving that nonverbal feedback but then i say something and they nod sometimes mm-hmm. i'll pick up on and be like oh oh yeah 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 and then you know i'll give them a nod but uh, so i work with somebody that just nods constantly and it's like okay now it's gone from a positive in my mind from a positive to a distraction because i don't understand why you're nodding so much like uh every sentence it's a nod every single sentence so you can't overuse it and we've talked about that before but i think brian i think moving forward i'm gonna try another one i'm gonna try uh this ask clarifying questions i think i'm gonna do that moving forward i'm gonna try that this week uh in addition to whatever we get out of this week's episode oh yeah definitely yeah you know that asking clarifying questions i've always loved doing that i really it's just it's one of those things i i think when we started ELM, Ed, that I, I actually believe that almost intensified it because of what you had to do during ELM to, to create discussions is basically ask those clarifying questions. But instead, instead of asking clarifying questions, say straight to the person who said something, I would like bounce that off somebody else. You know, so I don't know that that's been kind of like a that's kind of like one of my favorite things to do when communicating because it really it shows an engagement to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's why I think that I need to work. I want to work on it because moving forward, you know, the the job, the mission that I have uh, that I talked to you about, I'm going to be dealing with a lot of people and various cultures and languages. So I'm going to need to have better understanding, and those clarifying questions could really probably help pull that out and and give me the understanding I need. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think it's time to to press forward, man, on this charisma thing and check out, you know, the th- the second element that we uh, talked about the other day, which is power. Right off the bat, man, uh, I was I was kind of I was struck by this a little bit at first because you you don't you as soon you just see it, you think okay, power, power, power. You know, like powerful people that type of thing. But once you got it, once I got into reading it, I was like, oh, okay, it just it's having that presence of power almost. So it's almost like 
not only presence, but also presence of power. That is what is that key indicator, you know, um, right here. I saw it, um, you know, and it was funny. You mentioned, because we talked about the book, The Charisma Myth. And then you mentioned to me yesterday, that, cause, because this is actually 2.2 of the try of this episode, because obviously we didn't get to record yesterday. <laughs> um, but you mentioned to me that you actually picked up this book by Olivia Caban, The Charisma Myth. And you also... I absolutely did. And you also have the audio version too? Yes, I have the audio book version and... Um... So it's a, it, the only challenge to it for me was there are exercises throughout her book that she wants you to do. And she even tells you, don't wait till you've read the whole book to go back and do these. She wants you to do them as you reach them in the book. And that's that's very difficult when you're driving. <laughs> so I have uh, my chunk of time for that book it has to be after I get home in the evening. It's kind of a wind down thing where I can go through the exercises. But it's a, it, you know, it is a really good book. I, I thought, she, I think she does a great job. I like the exercises. I think they complement the lessons throughout the book. So yeah, yeah, I know the, the first episode of uh, this series made me go get the book. So the funny thing is, is I brought a bunch of books with me. I mean, I left a lot of my books at home, but I bought a, I brought a bunch of books with me. And one of the books that I brought was the charisma myth and i did not realize it until i you know like you said something to me yes i was like wait a second are you talking about the charisma myth and you're like yeah you, you know you talked about it yesterday and i didn't even think about it man and then you know once we started talking i was like wait a second i got that so i went and found it and i have it too but i have the i have the paperback version which now i'm gonna i'm gonna have to go through and you know start looking at things and and really try to uh, utilize those same techniques that you're talking about that you heard. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty stoked about this. Uh, with that though, audience, I'm going to make sure I add a link to the Amazon for Charisma Myth. And that way, if you want, you're kind of curious about what we're talking about, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link. I'll do it for, you know, the paperback, the Kindle, and, and then you can figure out whatever you want. So with that, Ed, you ready to get into this about uh, Charisma is Power? I love the idea of charisma is power remember he man remember, hey brian sorry remember, he -Man? remember <laughs> yeah. i have the power see he man was charismatic <laughs> oh man <laughs> so it's funny you brought up he man i you know, you know how you get stuck in um the like facebook videos like you just keep watching these videos that pop you know that populate below a video that you started and they're kind of somewhat like it <laughs> yeah. so yesterday i was i don't know it was a movie it was something about a movie that's coming out and i watched the video about it and then the very next one was about do you remember the the dolph lundgren masters of the universe movie absolutely I liked the movie, but the person who narrated this and, and talked about it, it was so funny because he's, he said he, he was basically kind of like it was almost like he was talking about the movie, but he was also uh, dissing the movie the whole time. And when he's like, the Masters of the Universe movie, only half the movie is about the Masters of the Universe. The rest of it is about this kid who lost her parents and this boy who loves this girl and all this. And it was just so hilarious. And then he goes into the point about like, and what happened to Trapjaw? Why couldn't we bring Trapjaw involved? You know, and like he started like <laughs> criticizing characters. And and then he talks about uh, Dolph Lerner and he's like, and He-Man, what happened to He-Man? He can't talk. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> it was hilarious, man. So that's what, I'm yeah, like that's my little bit of, but. All right, so here we go. One of the key things that we noticed that Cobain, she put out there, a power according to her, is simply means being perceived as able to affect the world around us, whether through influence or authority over others. Large amounts of money, expertise, intelligence, sheer physical strength, or high social status. Those that, that, That's what she's kind of saying is you know, like how to basically to, you know, have power. I could see that in many ways. I can also see that, you know, so there's the good side of power and the bad side of power. You know what I'm talking about, man? Like where oh, yeah. somebody, they have, you know, large amounts of money and they may be powerful with large amounts of money, but they're not really using it for the right things. They're not really, you know, you know they're trying to be charismatic, but they're really not. They're just being forceful. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. No, I I literally just came from Rome. And I mean, I'm pretty sure that's a big chunk of the downfall of that empire is that that very thing you're talking about. 
Exactly. Yeah, it just it feels well. Yeah, yeah, you're right there. Um, which, <laughs> by the way, that Rome trip, how was it, man? I know we didn't talk about it much. Oh, it was. Uh, so it's the second greatest place I've ever been, right behind. I, I well, I mean, it's the first. Second is Paris. It's the first, uh, the greatest place. The Coliseum is the most impressive thing I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen nothing like it. Um, it's been through some things, and I didn't know they took chunks of the Coliseum to build St. Peter's Basilica in uh, the Vatican City. Really? I didn't know that either. Yeah, so the Coliseum, they took chunks of the Coliseum to build other structures within Rome and you know, in the Vatican City's right there. And then there's the holes that make it look like Swiss cheese. Well, the way they used to hold the the brick together was with iron clamps, and iron was very valuable uh, at one time. So they were actually digging into the Colosseum, into the marble and the stone to get the iron clamps out to pilferage them. Wow, man, that's that's that. Uh, I bet you that uh, that that it's. I don't know, man. I just think about it, and I'm like, wow, you know, that's uh, probably the most impre- one of the most impressive things you can see, you know, next to like the pyramids of it's, Gaza and you know stuff like that. And that's what I said. I told my wife, now we gotta go to the pyramids. Like, it's the only way we can trump the Colosseum. The Colosseum was just. And we didn't even get to see the basement part. So next time we go back, we're going to go into the basement. Yeah, man, that's awesome. You know, I mean, and you think about like, you, you could almost compare that like to the, to the, today's lesson. Like what took place in that Coliseum was a display of power, not only on the arena floor, but also uh, with the ruler, and then also with the crowd, because you know just how they determine life and death and all that stuff. Like that, that was like a, kind of a weird display of it, I guess you would say. I mean, it's definitely because of some of the violence that took place. But hey, you know, it's battle, and that's what happens, man. Yeah, and then there's so many people that died there. They have no idea an exact number of gladiators, and you know, they used to punish criminals publicly there. That's where they would execute criminals uh, after lunch. Uh, <laughs> they would execute their criminals right there in the arena. Well, they have no idea how many people they know millions of animals and they know more than 500,000 people died in that arena, but they have no clue like what the number is. Wow. That's something else, man. All right. So let, I guess we probably should get back to the story, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, impressed. Well, with we talk about power. So we talk power, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. You talk power. Then you talk about good and bad power. Well, I mean, and even the Coliseum. Uh, so the Coliseum is actually built on what used to be Nero's pools. And Nero was an egomaniac, and the Romans did not like him. But he used his money and powers to build this golden palace and all this other stuff. And after he was gone, the Romans said, yeah, we got to get rid of this stuff. And they literally built the Coliseum on top of one of his pools. And, and he was the guy that abused power. So, I mean, but then a guy like, you know, Julius Caesar – the Romans loved Julius Caesar. They still throw flowers where his body was laid after he was killed. Uh, they still throw coins at the memorial for him all these years later, but it's because, you know, he, he brought money into Rome and he brought all this stuff into Rome. So he used his power and his influence. You know, he was charismatic. Julius Caesar is probably one of the most charismatic leaders of all time. Just, I mean, he got killed because of his charisma, basically. Wow. Yeah. That's, I definitely, uh, so it ties in. Now I want to go see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it ties into, you know, it ties in very well to the episode. I think that trip. Absolutely. So let's move on with, uh, with what this, what this is talking about here. Uh, powerful people can get things done, or at least they give that impression. Charismatic individuals draw people into their orbit like a magnet, and power is the crux of of that magnetic force. It's a primal attraction. Back in our caveman times, our survival could depend on being chummy with the big dogs at the top of the social hierarchy. Uh, To better enable us to seek out and latch onto such people, our brains evolved to cue in on body language and status markers that indicate power. Uh, You know, when I read that, Ed, you know what I think about is there's a lot to do with and you know we call the show instinctive influencers and and that's kind of code more for us about being good leaders but in a sense being good leaders is being a good influencer and influencing those around us you know 
getting to do instead of like forceful leadership. But I think about the word influencer because that's thrown around a lot. And I, I kind of dislike how it's thrown around. Uh, one of the thing, big things is social media influencers is one of the key things that I've, I've seen it with. Um, and I've, I've been getting a lot of, obviously because the show is, in, is called Instinctive Influencer. And you know I, I look for it and stuff like that. And I do different things with it through my phone. So when it comes to my Google feed, it sends me information about influencers. And it, it's funny, sometimes it sends me these uh, articles about negative influencers or people who are phonies and fakes in the social media realm. And it made me think about this, this whole uh, to better enable us to seek out and latch onto such people, our brains evolve to cue in on body language and status markers that indicate power. So for instance, when I think of this, I think of, you know, uh, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of those Kardashian people at all. I, I just, I, I think they're a waste of time. I, I don't think they provide anything to society personally, but that's just me. Some people may like them. And if you like them, hey, that's that's up to you. But when I think about that, it's like, I also think about how those individuals project themselves, right? How they'll allow certain things in the media to create like a hubbub about them. Uh, but they may not allow other things. And it's not just them. It, 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 I mean, you think about, let's think about like, uh, and I don't want to talk politics in general, but just think about politicians in general, how they want to show the, how powerful they are but they do everything they can to keep their dirt out of the news because they feel like it diminishes that power. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, and then think about you talk about politicians, but how much training they go through to give them a certain stance. Uh, you know, uh, if you look back at President Obama and his hand gestures and how they changed over the course of his presidency, you can see him change and get more uh, controlled. But they're they're groomed, literally groomed, to make you see them and see power. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a you know, yeah, it's kind of a, a a kind of a cheat thing. But but then you look at a guy like, say George Washington, right? George Washington was reluctant. He didn't want the leadership and the power that was given to him. He was just there, but because of his charisma, because of how he walked and because of how he fought and, and the way his mind worked, you know, he ends up, you know, being the great general and he ends up being the president of the United States reluctantly in both cases. Uh, and I mean, could you imagine if he is here today to see what his role is in history uh, based off of the power that he portrayed? It's funny you brought him up uh, and I wish I would have brought I wish I would have brought my book with me because I'm actually, you know, reading that General Washington. I'm reading a couple of different books at once. It's crazy. Uh, I know, but, me too. <laughs> and it's between him right now and then my school book and then the new uh, Call Sign Chaos about Mad Dog Mattis. I mean, it's like I'm all over the place. But when I go back and I think about it, and I think we talked about this, actually, you and I just in private conversation, not over the uh, over the show. But Abigail Adams, she was she was just in awe of how he presented himself and how she described him in her letters back to her husband. During that time frame, I think that was considered to be okay, good and all that stuff. But as I was reading, I think I thought to myself, I was like, it sounds like this woman has a crush on George Washington himself because of how charismatic he was and how much power he projected. I mean, I actually got a little uncomfortable reading it, but you're right. Like he knew how to present himself no matter what. And even when it, like you start reading about him earlier on, you start reading his younger childhood and just his upbringing, you're like, wow, like it was, he was very good at watching and learning to ensure he did the right thing or presented the right, uh, the, just like how he presented himself. And I mean, you're, you're exactly on point when it talks about like, I think Washington is probably one of our earlier examples of great power in America in a charismatic form. Yeah. And, and like I said, I don't, I don't think it was, he wasn't groomed to be that way. It wasn't by design. So when you look at my guy, general Patton, general Patton knew from an early age, he wanted to be a great general. He made sure he was groomed to be a great charismatic general. He, he knew to walk upright. He knew to wear his boots and polish them. He knew to keep his helmet shine because he wanted to give that aura of himself. So he groomed himself to be that, that symbol of power where Washington just kind of was like, Oh, I am. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. You want me to be what? The president. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, so just two different, very different leaders, two great generals, but just different ways of going about it. Uh, I would say George Washington was more just instinctive. <laughs> oh, by far, man. Uh, he, about he, was how he came. Yeah. 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 He was. He was. He was an amazing general. And that's, and that's kind of like why I'm like right now, I am kind of stuck in this general Washington kind of mode and Mathis because I'm reading both of those books, but I'm really like, I'll read a little bit about them and their books. I'll read something in their books and then I'll, I'll do some research like on the internet. Cause you know, the internet never lies, but, um, <laughs> so I, I really think he has what it takes. You know, I, I could only imagine what he would be like right now today. Like he would put, he would put people like, especially in politics to shame, you know, just the way he was. Um, so, hey, let's oh, move yeah. on. We're going to move on with this, and we're going to actually be jumping into like nine separate elements of how basically you show that power. Uh, but real quick, this is what they have to say here. It's extremely important to point out here that each of the three components of charisma must be definitely combined in order to produce personal magnetism. You may be the most affable a tentative person in the room, but without power, people at best just see a nice guy and at worst, someone who's needy and desperate. It may seem harsh, but generally the value people place on your presence and warmth depends upon the amount of power they perceive you have. Here's a quick example. If you receive a compliment on a job presentation from both a coworker and the CEO of the company, which compliment would mean more to you? If you're like most people, it's going to be the CEO because he's got the power. And I can, you know, Ed, I can see that too, right? So let's just say like one of my peers gives me a compliment or one of your peers gives you a compliment, right? But then let's say the CG, the commanding general of wherever you're at, they give you a compliment. And it's in this in front of the same group of people. It seems different, doesn't it, man? Well, it is different. Let's think about like you know, um, you know, we give coins of excellence in the military, right? Oh yeah. So don't we compare the coins of excellence? Oh, I have a I have a coin of excellence from a one star. Well, I have a coin of excellence from a two star general. So it's the same idea. Like, oh, I'm impressed because you got this three star general's coin. So it's kind of the same basic idea, right? Like we're we're stacking up their status based on who they are within organization. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. And and those of you who don't understand, uh, we call them they're called challenge coins. And the old school mentality of it's like kind of like if you're somewhere and you where you can have adult beverages, if whoever has the highest one wins, and the the one below that that's uh. Basically, the higher ranking one wins, and the one who loses has to pay for rounds or whatever. So it's kind of it's kind of funny how yeah. that works out. But yeah, I keep mine. Mine actually are back home. I didn't bring in them with me. I do have some. I got. I've received some since I've been here, and I kind of just I set them on my uh, my bureau uh, back in my room. But but yeah, that's those are you know what though, man. Those are kind of a prideful thing too. You know when when you look at them. I, I can look at each individual coin I have, and I probably have like thirty, thirty five. I don't know, and. I can almost tell you the exact moment or what each one was for because of how significant they were to me and the individuals that were giving them to me. Uh, I could, I could kind of feel that charisma of power and, and some of them, some of them, eh, not so much, but you know, so I totally can see that man. Yeah, no, when we read the article, that's the first thing I thought of was like, well, we rack and stack based off of these coins, kind of. But, you know, you just brought up something interesting. So I have one from a warrant officer who's just a, who was a CW2, Chief Warrant Officer 2. And the warrant officer had, I think, I, I don't know if I talked about it on the show or if we talked about it in private, but they only had 10 coins made. And they delivered these 10 co coins to the 10 people who had the biggest impact on their career. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those 10 for this warrant officer with 20 years in the, in the service. And to me, it's one of my most valuable coins. It's one of my favorites because of that. Oh yeah, man, that sounds great. You know, I mean, I, I totally understand where you're getting at with that. Um, and when you say that it's, it's kind of funny. Um, I have a 
I have a coin when uh, actually I had two different coins, both given to me by my father in law uh, when I was promoted to E7. And then also when I was promoted to Master Sergeant, he gave me coins and he got my name engraved and the date and stuff. So I found, you know, that didn't come from a general. That didn't come from, you know, somebody who I served with in the service, even though my father in law served and he retired uh, much before I even entered. Uh, I find that those are kind of really important because he was a senior non-commissioned officer and then he gave those to me. And, you know, it's kind of like the feeling that that passing of the torch type thing. So, and, and he and I have a pretty good relationship, I would think uh, that I, I just, I felt like those were the important ones to me, you know? Yeah, no, I'm, I can see how those would be important as well. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Offering an impression of power mainly comes down to enhancing the things humans are wired to hone in on when trying to determine someone's level of it, body language and appearance, right? Uh, But just before that, he talks about increasing your charismatic power may seem difficult. It may feel like applying for a job where you need experience to get hired. But to get that experience, you need to have that job first. So we're going to get into this. We're actually going to get into uh, basically these different proven they're, they're considered proven power boosters, and we're going to talk about them a little bit, and then we're going to look at kind of doing a, a little bit of the same thing we did last week, but I th- I, I kind of feel like the power one's going to take a little bit longer, so we'll, we'll see where we go with it, right? So right off the bat, the first one is boost your confidence. Do you find it hard to boost your own confidence, Ed? Well, it depends on what the situation is or what we're, what we're dealing with. Uh, so I, I'll say, yeah, yeah. it's very, um, I was going to say mission dependent. It's very uh, dependent <laughs> on, the, on the situation. And, you know, to tell you the truth, like for me, one of those things I, I think about when it comes to boosting my confidence, it could be in multiple things. Is it my physical ability, my mental ability, you know, uh, what, so with decision making or to be able to physically do something? Obviously, as we get older, we, we can't do the things we did when we were younger, but we also become more knowledgeable. So it's almost like it's a transfer of that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I, I don't know, like, for instance, your extremes of physical ability when you were younger versus now that you're older, like Oof. same with me. I mean, matter of fact, I just said something to you before we started about <laughs> like, I know I am no spring chicken. And when I did this workout today, I was like, wow, I need work, but it's not going to get any easier as I get older. No, it doesn't trust me. It doesn't get <laughs> but when when you talk about boost your confidence, like I said, it was it's scenario driven. So I was just thinking about when we were at the academy, right? When you got there, you weren't very confident. But I like to think that as we gain mastery, as we get better at facilitating uh classes and, and dealing with the students, then our confidence went up. Oh yeah. And um I feel like that you probably carried yourself. Yeah. You carried yourself with a different uh, presence as you walk through the hallways, because you knew these newer cadre were looking to you for answers to help them reach that same mastery. So your confidence went way up. So that's one situation where, you know, over a three year period, I went from like, Oh man, I can't believe this. I'll never be able to do it to say, this is easy. I got this. Oh, yeah, that, that's boosting. I mean, that's why I say it's very mission, you know, uh, or very uh, dependent on where you're at in the situation. Yeah, you call it task oriented, probably in the civilian sector. I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's think about it here. So power first begins in the mind. If you feel confident and powerful, others will feel it too. Self assurance gives you an irresistible aura that draws people in and makes them want to get to know you better. Developing confidence deserves its own post, but for now, uh, we're going to talk about in, in a form of mastery, right? Expertise, and that's what you brought up just a second ago. Expertise, regardless of the skill or the area of knowledge, marks you as someone with resources and a man with enough perseverance or woman uh, to plunge to that very depths of a subject. Attaining mastery over something will also fundamentally change the way you feel about and carry yourself. Putting the rest of these tips into practice will also help boost your confidence. All right. And we're going to get to those. But I mean, when I think about this, right, if I don't know something, right, if I don't know how to. uh, So, for instance, we are we're trying to get uh, trying to get some heaters uh, up and running. 
All right, these particular types of heaters, they, they've been down for a little while. And I just happened to kind of throw it out there because I didn't know uh, with my senior NCOs, like, hey, does anybody know exactly how to get these particular heaters up and going? You know, check them, do good PMCSs on them to really under, like more in depth than what the book type says, you know, because of experience. And one of my uh, battles, he actually said, oh, yeah, man, I, I, I know how to do this. We did it. I did it in the field one time. We tore all this apart. And usually this and this are the two primary functions that create the problems that we're seeing. And I'm like, OK, cool. And then what I did is I said, hey, man, I want to get with you. I want to know everything you know about this. And the reason being is because I want to have that confidence to be able to project that off to somebody else and be able to teach someone else and then kind of have that mastery if that makes sense. Um, so I can see that's how I understand like this whole boosting your own confidence by trying to learn and understand. Uh, Ed, you often refer to this in every episode we've ever done is lifelong learning, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it is lifelong learning. And we're and even the next one's going to carry over into the the lifelong learning. But yeah, I mean, what I know now versus what I knew 10 years ago is totally different. And as leaders, as we move up through our ranks within the military, right? And it's got, it's got to be the same in the civilian sector. The expectation. So currently you're, you're ahead of me by one, right? One rank. So the expectation for you is higher than what it is for me. You're expected to know a little bit more than what I know. And, and it, every time you get promoted, you're expect to have more responsibility and more knowledge, more responsibility. And that gives you that confidence right. walking around as a leader to be able to, you know, have that presence. Yeah. Well, and, you know, though, I want to I don't want to uh, for people to, you know, misunderstand what we're talking here, too, because there's also those people who show too much confidence and they re- they're basically just arrogant. You know, and those are the types of people like, okay, I got you. Yeah, you know too much, whatever. Uh, What you're kind of speaking about is, yeah, I'm expected to know more. But if I don't know, then I'm expected to figure it out. To and go learn that's, it, yeah. I think that's a key piece. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're going to get into the next little piece. I actually, I'll, I'll have you kind of explain it, but where I'm thinking about with this is, is I don't know the supply system like you would or understand how to, you know, deal with the, the, the universe of supply. But if I know somebody like you, Ed, I could probably bounce things off of you and say, hey, man, can you tell me about this? Help me understand a little bit about X, Y, and Z of the supply system because I'm having difficulties and I want to understand the whole realm of it and be able to problem solve. Because when it comes down to it, part of boosting your confidence, I feel, uh, is is what we're about to talk about, but also being able to use that for good problem solving uh, and having good problem solving skills when things come above, you know, come awry. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, so as, as a supply guy, like it's important for us to be able to share information. Uh, you're a mechanic. I don't expect you to be the subject matter expert on all things supply, but you should know a little bit about supply, right? To be successful because you do have property, you do have equipment. Um, I expect you to be able to make my helicopter get off the ground or whatever kind of mechanic you happen to be, you know, um, physical training. I expect you to know how to give physical training because those are, that's one of the things that leads to um, power uh, and presence is knowing a little bit about a lot. So, and, and I think a lot of that which, comes to which brings us to number two. Oh uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah, you're right. Number two. That's our number two topic. Know a little about a lot. <laughs> so yeah, this is important to me. I think it's very important. So in addition to one area of expertise, all right, you should also seek to know as much about as many subjects as possible. This is where my wife is. She's very good at this because I always tease her that she's a vast book of useless knowledge, but she knows a little bit about a lot of stuff. So that's that's her part of her presence, right? Intelligence is one of the key markers of a man who is able to affect the world around us. And the more conversations you can confidently wade into and add on to, the smarter and more well-liked you will seem to uh, to others. This, yeah, this is like, and I think the Army does a good job at grooming us for this because you do have to know a little bit about uh, everything. What's the old saying? Um, Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. Well, yeah. All right. We want you to be master of your job, but you know what I mean, Brian? So yeah, 
for you, like in your experience, how important has this been throughout your career to know a little bit about a lot? Well, it's funny uh, you brought that up. Last week, uh, I spent a full day outside, like literally in the grind with nothing but privates and uh, Katusas, which they're basically the augmentees of the Korean National Army, but out there in the grind, putting up tents with these guys because none of them knew how to properly put this tent together, these types of tents. And we'd gotten a whole bunch of them in, and we, hmm. you know, we're just basically do some things and, and, and to kind of work things out and figure out how to operate things within our organization. So we get all these tents in. Well, you know what an A-frame tent is. Yeah. I know what an A-frame tent is and how they go together. But they when they saw this, they had no idea what this stuff was. So it was kind of I, I really felt what you're talking about. Like I knew I know a little a little bit of a lot of different things. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember putting these up some time back. I've had them, you know, on these couple different units and whatnot. And so we, I went through and I was able to kind of explain them step by step. I didn't want them to, I didn't want to explain everything to them on like, okay, you do this, 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 and all this and all these, and then, okay, make it happen. Instead, I broke it down to them in steps, which kind of, I would say it di- displayed my knowledge on that area. And I mean, yeah, come on, it's tense, right? Well, well, yeah, but if you don't do certain things right, you can break stuff and, you know, things like that. But yeah, I went through and it, I think that kind of hit upon exactly like, that's not my expertise. Tents are not my expertise. Generators are not my expertise. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I definitely would say that uh, my expertise has kind of shifted through the years, but it's understanding that, and 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 it, you said it right there. How do you gain a wide breadth of knowledge? I really believe I like what they say here, but I think it's trying. It's you as an individual try to get involved in more, try to do more, or try to learn more. Now he says here, he says read, 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 read every chance you get. Now reading does help. You and I, I mean, we preach about reading all the time to the listeners. Like read this or read that. Yes. Understand? I understand that, but you know just as well as I do, Ed, that there's also You've got to physically do some things. You've got to like actually go through the actions on some things to actually understand it. It could be, uh, let, let's say it's a, 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 a supply, like a transportation supply organization in a civilian sector. Well, and we talked about this before uh, when we talked about making sand tables. If you don't physically go through it and see it and understand it, you may not really have a full breadth of knowledge. Yeah, the visualization is, is key, and then the, the actual physical experience is, is very important. I mean, yeah, read, 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 and there's examples like you know you just talked about. You're reading a book, Call Sign Chaos. Uh, ah, by love it. The former Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, right? And in it, he talks about how much he read, and then he talks about in the early days of this, uh, the global war on terror, how he was strategically using things he had read. Right. To make decisions on the battlefield. And again, he was going back to ancient warfare times and using that to drive decision making in 2003. That's an example of where re 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 like obviously he he's probably practiced and got the muscle memory through training with his troops. But there's a reason that these great leaders uh, have these giant extensive libraries because of the read, read, read. But I'm I'm like you too. Like at some point, I could read how to put that same tent together. That doesn't mean I know how to put that tent together until I get out there and and start putting. You know what I mean? Putting that tent together. And by the way, for those that have never experienced these wonderful tents, a lot of the tents that the military buy, well, it's like solving the riddle of the Sphinx. Like these things are not <laughs> easy to put together. It's not as simple as that that tent you can buy at the local Walmart and throw up. You know. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah, so yeah, I can know everything that there is in writing on that tent does not mean I can put that tent up does not know that I know how to set the stove up or the heater for the tent, you know, so you have to know those other areas as well to get that power, right? That's the power people see. They're like, wow, you know, first our knows like this is a, a you know, you uh I don't know if you ever got to meet Command Sergeant Major Sayatola, but Command Sergeant Major Sayatola, like you're talking about a guy who had elevated to some of the highest positions for a Sergeant Major in the Army, but he came to visit us one time in our motor pool in Iraq, and he looked at a guy, and he goes, you're about my size. Go get your coveralls. Bring them to me. And he puts on coveralls, and his background was maintenance, 
And here's this command star major of a core at the time, right? Right. And he rolls under the truck and he changes ball joints for the rest of the afternoon with the soldier. So what's the impression he just left? That soldier's like, wow, Star Major has not worked on vehicles in how many years? But here he is changing these ball joints on the Humvee. And not only is he changing ball joints in the Humvee, he's doing it shoulder to shoulder with me. That's mm. presence. That's power. So he's combined these two things. That's charisma. And he was a very charismatic leader. One of the greatest Star Majors I've ever dealt with. But yeah, so... That that's uh, to me that's an excellent example. He you gotta know a little bit about everything. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I I, I kind of it makes me wonder because you know the next show is actually gonna be the third element of you know being charismatic and that's warmth. So it also makes me wonder like how he fit into that puzzle a little bit, you know. So, but I I would definitely think that the engagement during that uh that particular little task it probably wasn't like a a demeaning or or, or anything like that. There probably was some conversation to be had during it and that it it was probably mm-hmm. there was probably an essence of warmth along with that wouldn't you think i it definitely was and not just that conversation underneath that humvee going on but what about the people who saw it what about specialist haley going back to the office and say y'all won't believe this but the third course our major is out there changing ball joints like you know what i mean like the word of mouth that what he did gets him that gets him more respect more you know because of who he is yeah he's got rank on his chest and we talked about this so there is a level of his presence that's based off of i'm the star major of this entire core but at the same time there he is you know i had a first sergeant who used to gun on the gun truck sometimes when we did convoys yeah that's way below what y'all are expected but that's who he was he's like if i'm gonna put my soldiers Mm -hmm. in a turret i'm willing to get in a turret too just yeah, how he was. Uh, what was his name? Becerra. First arm Becerra. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I can't remember. I can't remember the SARM first class when I was, I was a private in basic training. And I think I've mentioned this before on the show and I'm just going to reiterate it. Uh, we had just done this obstacle course at basic training, which was 21 years ago. Um, we did this obstacle course and he, <laughs> we were out there and you know how you have your little detail and you have to put the sandbags back in line. You basically do a cleanup type thing. And he was out there and he was, he was helping us physically doing the things. And if this is stuck with me, Ed, the, my entire career, my entire career, this one comment by a Sergeant First Class, who I don't even know his name. I wish I did. Uh, he said to me, he said, don't ever show that you can't do what your soldiers can do. And Show them that you have that same ability they have, and they'll respect you more. And I thought that right there, yeah, that's. And I, I, I always think of that. And now it's funny, like I, I'll grab, I, I may walk in the office in there, and I'll notice that the trash is uh, getting a little higher, and maybe uh, it's time to uh, take it out. But they hadn't gone, you know, the, the end of the day hasn't happened, so obviously, and I'll just grab it, take it outside, and it's always every time, you know, what they'll, they'll no, let me take care, I'll do that for you. You don't need to do that. And I was like, no, I'm. I don't have broken hands. Uh, I can work just as hard as you. And thank you very much. But I, I think it's my turn to take it out. So and I would do, you know, stupid stuff like that, you know, or sweeping. I mean, it's to show you can still do the the basics really helps out. So, yeah, man, I loved your story, brother. That's that's motivating in itself. Yeah, no, that's right. Brian. I mean, I'm a big subscriber too to that, you know, with the soldiers can do it. I can do it type of mentality. And I would challenge. I mean, I'm not by no means am I the absolute end all be all expert on military history and leadership, but I would challenge you to find a military leader in history who did not circulate to the front lines of that battlefield or fight shoulder, like Caesar shoulder to shoulder, Hannibal shoulder to shoulder, Patton, Washington uh, shoulder to shoulder. Lincoln, who was not a military leader did is uh, well known to have spent all his time in the defense department during the fighting uh, of the Civil War, waiting for the telegram, the instant it come in for front line. But then his troops, Grant, uh, even on the other side, Lee, these guys were all listening to bullets whiz by them leading their soldiers. So, I mean, I don't think you can find a leader who was not like that. Uh, even General Mattis. General Mattis, Battle of Fallujah, he's right there, right? He's right there at the front leading his guys. And he was a general already, and he's still trying to go to the front. 
Yep, exactly. And and often they try to pull them guys back. It's it's insane how they, you know, like uh so if somebody hire them like, "No, you need to be back." And they're like, "No, I'm in this mix. I'm in this fight." Uh I mean, we talk about it and obviously we're we're in the army, but we respect those other services and we talk about about Chesty Puller and his ability to just get into the fight. I mean, we I'm I'm I didn't even know who he was really, to be honest, until I heard Jocko talking about it. And then I started, you know, looking at more and it's just like, wow, this guy was, he was freaking amazing, man. You know? So, but yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. 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 And, and so all these guys, so all these guys, Brian, enable for them to do that. It, it's going to lead us into this next topic. This is one of the things that they, they have to be in order to uh, have the, perseverance to oh, yeah. continue to fight to fight these long battles and hours so would you uh w- would you talk to us about the next one i think this next one is something that's actually between you and i although we work we do different types of workouts you know we work um <laughs> our what we do is a little bit different we are still we still get after it and i think i feel like ed between you and i i think this is an important thing that you and i see as a soldier and just as a human being it's becoming physically fit. And we've, we talked about that in an episode before about presence is being fit. Um, you know, it's funny and I, I'm going to get into what they have to say here, but so, uh, general Abrams, he's here, you know, USFK commander and he, yes. he's all, he's all over the place on social media. He's, I, I, I love reading his posts all the time. It's just, it's just hilarious. And he, and, and, and some of them are informative and, and really good, but he does a lot, a lot of posts of, physically fit type things where he's out doing stuff with his entourage or his soldiers or whatever that work directly with him. I uh, just did the army 10 miler in Washington, DC. Now he's back here with us, you know, type thing. I see him sometimes like I'll be, I go to the gym, but I go to the gym at zero five when it opens before PT at six 30, but I'll go to the gym and sometimes I'll, I'll be kind of almost about to leave. And that's usually when he's showing up, going upstairs, and he does the CrossFit thing like I do. Uh, but and I know, you know, how you feel about Ed, but but he at at his age, you know, I mean, he's he's up there a little bit. He still gets after it like like nobody's business. And to me, I think that really sets a precedence um, of what kind of leader he is. And I think the guys that you talked about before, they had a physical fitness uh, to them that kind of portrayed power. Uh, let, let's see right here what it talks about, Ed. Your body shape is one of, if not the first thing people take in when they meet you. I, I mean, that, that says a lot, really. You know, you think about it. When you first are introduced with somebody, you notice their, that you notice their, who they are before they say one word to you. The physically fit part and the very next one we're going to talk about, dress for power. Those are the two things. Be, they could be walking towards you. Those are the first two things that you notice about those people. Those that whole first impressions, the lasting impression. I really do believe that. I, I firmly believe yeah. that because yeah. if you show up to me and I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say this, and people are gonna get a little upset and they'll be like, "Well, I'm kind of big." No, in the army, you can't be fat. You, I'm, and when I say, I mean like obese. You know, I'm, I'm a little heavier. I, I get taped. So we do this thing where we have to meet a certain height weight requirement, right? And and I know you're the same way, Ed, because you're you're a, a larger person. Not I'm not saying you're fat. I'm saying you're a lar- you're shoot you're way taller than I am, and your arms are about as big as my head. But we both <laughs> get you, taped. <laughs> 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 but but we both get we have to do what's called a tape test to figure out our body fat percent because it has to be under a certain amount. Now that doesn't that doesn't mean that we look obese. But I'm talking about people who look like they just got off a couch they've been sitting on for six years eating them but Cheetos. You know what I'm saying? Like that says something to me. Now, somebody would say, well, you know what? They may be really intelligent. They're good. I got that. I understand that. But especially in our our line of work, if you're that big, how do I drag you off the battlefield? How do I – or how do we mm-hmm. run for cover together? You know what I'm saying? Like I think of those things. And and it's not to make – and I'm all about you know trying to get people physically fit and stuff like that. And if some people just – you know, they got I got a thyroid problem. Okay, I got you. There's medication for that or you can do – you know, whatever. Uh, and people may think I'm being a little cruel sounding with this. I, I understand. But in my mind, I just – like the things that populate in my head, Ed, are like diabetes, heart issues, um, just different types of cancers, 
you know, that our body, when we don't even, we don't even know the, all the elements that lead into like all the, some of these different things, but we do understand like, so for instance, you know, they talk about runner's high or, 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 uh, physical fitness, like, uh, like the endorphins and how those kick in and make us feel good. Like that helps your body makes you feel better about yourself first. And then other people also notice those things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no. And, and you think about like, I don't, I'm, I don't want you, I'm not going to use the name. You'll know who I'm talking about. You know, when we were together in the aviation unit, we had a Camo guy, amazing, really good guy, hilarious, hard worker, but he was way outside the regulations. I think you'll know who I'm talking about if you really think about it. He was way out the regulations, but some stuff maybe got overlooked here and there, and they maintained him, and he deployed. Mm -hmm. Like that, and I'm like, like we're yeah. talking when I say way over, we're talking double figures over the body fat percentage, yeah. and and it was based off his work ethic. And I was like, yeah, but I mean, yeah, he's a great worker, but there's another great worker out there that that mm -hmm. if they get wounded, I can help. But honestly, if he gets wounded, I can't help him. Like he could die, yeah, because I cannot get him to safety and, and, and to cover. So. And then the other thing to me, the more fit you get, uh, and, and again, I've by no mm -hmm. means been physically fit my entire career. I have struggled at times really bad with keep maintaining, uh, but the physical fit, it tells me you're disciplined. So when you go to a job interview and you're looking sharp in your suit and, you know, and you're looking physically fit, I know you have discipline at that point. I don't even have to ask a question. Oh, yeah. I don't need to know you were military. I know for a fact you have some kind of discipline, so I can work with that. You know what I mean? Yeah, to a certain extent, and and I don't want to. So I don't want to put too much emphasis on you know physically fit is the only thing because I truly do not believe that. I do not. Oh no, I'm not one of those people that believes if you can you can run um you know a 12 minute two mile you know on the APFT that you, that makes you a great leader. I do not believe that. I've seen many a people that can get a 300, which is a perfect score for those of you not in the service. I've seen many a people that get a 300 <laughs> that I would be scared to allow to lead soldiers. Um they're good workers maybe. You know, I and 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 it's just some people just are really strong or really fast and stuff. I got that. But what I'm getting at is is and what we look for, and I, I really think some of these sectors could do the same thing to a certain extent, obviously, because you can't, you know, discrimination could be a thing where in, uh, in our in our line of work, it's actually a requirement. And there are there are stipulations or regulations to help us, yeah. you know, help guide that. But I truly believe that, you know, like, for instance, I really think a lot of companies should really work towards wellness programs, right? Wellness programs to help people achieve more i mean you think about it. there's there's insurance companies dude that will lower your insurance rates just for having a wellness program yep. and to be able to show that people are participating in that wellness program i mean that's that's big if you if you know what i'm talking about man uh let, let's no, let's no, keep I going on about, so, oh yeah no go ahead man yeah yeah so I was going to say, so, you know, I, I visited my sister at work before my sister works for Duke energy in Charlotte in North Carolina. And when you first enter their building, they have a beautiful, beautiful gym. Now it's not a giant gold gym size gym, but it is very nice. And it's immediately upon entering into their little uh, compound in Charlotte. Like that's, that's how much the company cares and wants you to be able to, you know, you and I can jump off at lunchtime and go get a workout in because most military bases have that. Right. But if I'm working for this company that doesn't have a gym, I, I don't have that opportunity. But with with a company like Duke Energy, they're saying, well, we're going to give you the opportunity. We have showers. We have lockers. We have steam rooms. We have, you know, cardio equipment, weight equipment. We're going to give you the opportunity to use your lunch mm -hmm. or to get a workout in before you fight traffic. Or so to me, a company like that, that's appealing to me mm -hmm. as a job seeker. Yeah. And it, it really all starts with just doing something. You know, it, 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 you don't have to you don't have to be somebody you don't have to be a Rich Froning or a Matt Frazier or uh, or uh, what some of those uh, strongman guys that you watch, Ed, Ed Eddie Hall, uh, the the legendary Eddie the Beast Hall, the king of the deadlift, Brian yeah. Shaw, or yeah. one that all of our listeners is probably familiar with, uh, Hapthor Bjornsson, also the mountain 
in, on Game of Thrones, so I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with who he is. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, those those type of people that the, they're all they're all have a, a physical fitness to them. Obviously, I mean, you know, to be able to deadlift as much as Eddie Hall had, you know, there's there's some something there. Uh, but you don't have to be them, is what I'm saying. It's just. Dude, and I, I was just having a conversation with my wife earlier today. She's really excited because uh, the children, they just, and uh, she put a bunch of pictures online already. They just did their first kid Spartan race, which was really cool. I mean, my son was covered in mud and it, they were excited about it. And and my wife, <laughs> she's going tomorrow to do hers. And she's like, she was really, I could tell she was excited, like oh, in her voice wow. and stuff. So I was like, yeah, she's hooked. So yeah, she's going to go do her first one tomorrow. But and we just we're having conversations she's like, well, I, I just hope I can do really well. I'm like, honey, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you, at least you're trying. That's what matters. You know, and she's like, well, it's three miles and I've, you know, yeah. I don't do a lot of running like you do and all this stuff. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I said, you're doing something, you know, it's like it's people that will do 30 minutes of rigorous activity every day uh, to get their body well. That's what that's what really matters, man. So let's get into this a little bit further. It talks about a fit muscular physique sends a signal to the most primal parts of other people's brains about your strength and ability to dominate and protect. Physical fitness also signals to other people that you're disciplined and capable of enduring pain in pursuit of a goal. Oh, man, that, that speaks the truth. I, I went through that today. I was... I was like, I just got to about round eight of the 20.1 or yeah, 20.1 open. And I was like, what am I doing? How am I doing this? What is going on? You know, I was starting to doubt myself. <laughs> this is likely why men with an average to husky build make more money than both their skinny and obese peers. As reported by Wall Street Journal, one study found that thin guys earn $8,437 less than average weight men. But they were consistently rewarded for getting heavier, a trend that tapered off only when their weight hit the obese level. In one study, the highest pay point on average was reached for guys who weighed a strapping 207 pounds. Man, I th- man, that's I could see that too. You know, Ed, I could see that we're where it talks about the fitness is also signals to other people that you're disciplined and capable of enduring pain in pursuit of a goal because i mean how many times have you you know whether it be a deadlift or 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 you're squatting or you're bench pressing that you know, i mean you are in like you know it is painful and you're just struggling to get it up yeah. and you know it's a feat and others are just watching in awe <laughs> yeah i do like to, i like to watch it in awe without throwing the weight on the ground though of course i mean what am i uh i try not to throw the weights to get that attention mm. but yeah yeah no, i mean even running, like, uh, you know, before my, my injury, I used to run all the time, like 100 plus miles a week easily. And it's so painful. But the high you get and how good you feel after was, it was like, okay, that was worth it. Uh, mm-hmm. I won't run that far tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and you're like, oh, well, maybe I will. Like, yeah, it's just a, it's a risk reward, but the reward is always great. I find it. If people really look into it and really, if if they if they want to try something out of all these tips, I think this is one that's going to help them. It will help them uh, along the lines. I also, and this is what I want. I, I want to kind of like add to this a little bit. Is if you remember correctly earlier, I said something about like some people that are physically fit, they're not the smartest. You know, they're not the brightest bulb in the in the pack. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things I notice. If I've not been working out, let's just say I take two or three days off, which I I never do anymore. Now, I I work out actually every day now, but say I took two or three days off. I noticed that I'm mentally sluggish also for some reason. Does that that ever happen to you, Ed? Yes, and I'm also uh, the equivalent of hangry. My wife will tell me in a heartbeat that, you know, now I do take some time. So I'm I'm a body whisperer. Like I knew... Coming into this weekend, actually, I knew that my legs were a little more sore than usual, and it was because I went for a a record for me for squat. So this weekend, I have done nothing, Mm -hmm. Uh, no cardio, no lifting, any. I just am letting my body heal. So, and that's the important part of physical fitness to me is you got to listen to your body too. Don't, but it's an expertise thing too. So you got to get where you know, okay, that's pain. 
Like that's an injury. That's mm-hmm. just soreness. And that's a little extra soreness and know where your limits are. So, and that's one thing. I mean, pain is going to happen. That, it's just part of working out. It's, and it's not bad pain. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's temporary. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I, this weekend, I just, I just, I've been hanging out for two days and I'm okay. Now tomorrow, if I don't go, then I'll notice a change in my, my attitude i'll be sluggish i'll want a nap like i I can tell the difference if i go like that three day is kind of my limit hey three days if i'm if i'm at three days man i'm so sluggish to get back i mean i'm i'm pounding the pre-workout beforehand (laughs) because i'm just like uh, you know like i have to do a lot of stuff to warm up if if i'm that far in and and that's normally like when i'm in travel mode that's how it is right it's it's tougher to work out you can do some stuff here and there but yeah it's definitely tough uh, but hey so the very next one we're going to talk about because obviously we're only three in and we got to go through nine uh <laughs> is i, I want to hit upon this and then you can go even further if you like is dressing for power uh, I am a firm believer in this, like very much so that I think I have talked to you about it, Ed, yes. uh, in the past. This is but your specialty, right? Let's here. go into it. Uh, I love it, man. It's it's just one of those things. Clothing is one of our strongest power cues. That's the first sentence right there. And I believe that. I truly believe that. All right. This is coming from a guy, and my wife could totally attest to this. This is coming from a guy who used to think that jeans and a t-shirt for any type of thing or shorts and a t-shirt for in tennis shoes for any type of event was okay. I so I used to think a long time ago, I got lazy and all this stuff. But then I kind of, my mind kind of shifted a little bit and I started thinking about things and I saw how certain people are dressed and, and I, I know it's not right that you treat somebody different by the way they're dressed, but I also noticed that people talk to you a little bit different. People interact with you a little bit different on how you dress. Now, does that mean I completely changed how I dressed or, you know, because I wanted people to No, but I noticed that it kind of perceived a different type of person or it allowed that inner power of me or that inner uh, charismatic person in me to kind of shine and come out. Uh, Right here, he says, when we see a man in a military uniform with lots of ribbons on his chest and stars on his shoulders, we automatically think authority. But you don't have to don dress blues to garner this instantaneous respect from others. Uh, I, I mean, how many times have you ever, you know, people love people in uniform type thing, right? Um, oh, yeah. Studies have demonstrated again and again that simply wearing high status clothing is enough to influence people. For example, the charisma myth where she talks about, she talks about, she discusses one experiment that showed that people tended to follow a jaywalker sooner and more frequently if he was wearing a well-tailored suit than if he was wearing more scrumly looking clothing. I could see that. That's it. You know, that idea. I, I could tell you right now, this is just me. I'm one of those types of people. You should have some. T- you have should have at least two types of dress shoes: one black, one brown, and and decent looking, not some cheap looking dress shoes, not Skechers, but I'm talking like actually nice ones. I personally, I personally like Cole Haan. Uh, they're very comfortable and they look great. I think everybody should have some type of slacks, whether it be khakis or you know black or gray pants that are are dressier with a nice little. To me, I, I like that like little crease right down the leg that helps kind of show that I've, I've taken care of this. Um, he, uh, in here, they talk about le- uh, leather dress boots. I actually have a pair of decent leather style dress boots and they're, I find them to be kind of comfortable and at the same time, dressy enough to look good in, in a nice pair of jeans or, uh, khakis. And then he talks about also having a sport coat or blazer. I personally, I think everybody should have one or two it, it, at a minimum one uh you think about it you think about in ed let's think about uh like say in the 1930s and 40s uh especially mm-hmm. during the depression even when people were so poor they at least had one type of suit men that were we're talking were just dirt and grime getting in it just i mean just i mean crazy working hard in the coal mines whether it be on a farm plowing fields dealing with cows pigs whatever but they still had that one suit in the closet that they would wear on sundays and they would look good i i think we need to go back to that right i think i think a man should have something that they could put on or a woman a woman also don't get me wrong because a woman can present themselves in that classy manner also a man and a woman should have something that just kind of 
it sets themselves apart a little bit. It, it, it thing, presents like, uh, power. Power you know? suit or something. Uh, what are like your that? thoughts, Ed? Uh, yeah, I think that the, uh, the <laughs> I think the clothing does present a a aura of of power. Um, and you know, we talked about before, like uh position at a table but at the same time if everybody's in like a polo and the one guy in the room in the tie tie and jacket um people may look to him like oh is that that who's in charge or is that who has the room i mean so it, it is definitely um you know it's interesting to see that and when as you read on further when you talk about the jaywalking i i did some observation on that when i was in rome actually yeah, so it talks about basically how if a certain type of dressed person jaywalks, uh, people are more likely to follow the better dressed person. So if a guy in a you know a nice tailored suit crosses the street and jaywalks, you may see other people step off the curb and follow suit, as opposed to the you know the person who's dressed more shabbily. Uh, in the case in Rome, what I saw is. Uh, one of the local panhandlers kind of with jaywalk and nobody really would follow. And then, you know, the guy comes up and he, he was still kind of casual, kind of buttoned down uh, in slacks. And then he jaywalks and you'll see more people start to like cross at that point too. So it was weird. Cause I had just read I, or I just listened to it in her book as I was flying down there. And I, so when I got down there and I started looking around, I was like, Oh, that, that that right there is exactly what she's talking about. So it was interesting to uh, be able to observe what uh, she talks about in the book on uh, the charisma myth. I find it uh, what it is is they they because they show it's it's almost like in how you dress it shows confidence in who you are, right? So I mean, because some people may look at it and think I would never be able to pull that off, right? So it almost turns into like, wow, they really, they pulled that off really well. And I, to tell you the truth, I used to be that guy. Like sweaters, man. I used to hate sweaters. Now, I mean, you, come wintertime, a nice button up shirt, a tie, and like a Mr. Rogers sweater all day long, man. You know, it looks good, bro. I'm serious. Like, because it presents a certain type of person, a professional. Yeah. Sometimes you can, and you can even throw it with a pair of jeans sometimes. It's just, it's all in how you look at it. I mean, personally, I don't mind walking around like right, right now. I'm in athletic wear. Well, I went to the gym earlier and then I came to my office uh, and I'll walk around doing certain things in athletic wear. But other times it's like, okay, I need to put something on. Like we we had to go to this award ceremony up north uh, a couple days ago. And I was like, all right, well, I had to pick. The, I felt like I had to pick out the right outfit to kind of present who I am in this large, you know, gathering of people. And I'll take a few minutes to figure that out. You know, I mean, I'm not. I won't sit there and like ponder it for hours. But I'm like, okay, let me match this up, make this look good. You know, I mean, and and it's all part of presenting who you are. Because I'm telling you, when you show up and you look a certain way, before you let one word out of your mouth, if you have that physical fit look we talked about, and you get the the clothing. Now, all that's left is what we talked. The very first thing was building that confidence and having some knowledge on things and to be able to get things done. And it was crazy too, because when when we had a little incident of trying to get something taken care of that had to get taken care of really quick, hmm. there was this, a particular captain who came over to me, and I was the first person he wanted to help him fix this problem. You know, and it's because he knew. And I just, it's one of those things, man. So, um, oh, he talks right here. It's about somebody dressing with even a bow tie. I will tell you, I love the occasional bow tie and knowing how to, and that's a, that's a key thing I learned too. Learn how to tie a tie or learn how to tie a bow tie, I think is important because it kind of shows sophistication in a sense too. Uh, just a clip on doesn't work for me. You know, if you just got a clip on, well, it's just, you went and bought that. But if you took the time to understand how to actually do it and make it look good and graceful, I don't know how many times. When we were at the academy and we were still doing the uh, the ASU inspections in the very beginning, I would I would like put on little classes with the uh, the guys and show them, hey, this is how you do that double wins or not, you know, and learn how to do that. It's classy. So, all right, Ed, let's move on to this next one because I think this. Yeah, is... I, I hate tying. I hate tying. Do you? <laughs> all right, we'll do. We'll do. Uh, we'll... I hate. I hate tying. Extracurricular activity. I know how. <laughs> I just don't like doing. Oh yeah. No, because of my height. 
it's like no matter what I do, it feels like it always comes up too short. Now it usually takes me about three attempts. I know how to mm-hmm. tie it. It's just a a nightmare. I hate <laughs> tying it. I couldn't even imagine trying to tie a bow tie. Oh, it's the it's so like, cool. I would. I I'm going full clip on for a bow tie. You're you're gonna have to be angry about that. Oh, I wouldn't be angry with you. <laughs> like, when just, we do formals. Yeah. Hey, full clip on. <laughs> That's it, man. We got to get back together again. We're gonna have to get physically physical, you know, together so I can. Yeah. Uh, teach you the bow tie it's it's easier than tying a regular tie or a double <laughs> windsor so hey this next oh, one this is you then. this is what you've been wanting to talk about i know it has so why don't you take <laughs> us through this being the big gorilla so i can tell you brian that the next two i actually kind of play with each other so we may be able to cover we're going to probably go almost two for one here all right right so the next one is be the big gorilla so we done the clothing we did the body language right uh, we did the clothing, now body language. That's our next biggest influencer of other people's perception of our power. A nonverbal cue that indicates power is the amount of space an individual uses. As you probably intuited, powerful people take up more space than others. They act as, as the author Cobain describes, like big gorillas. Um, it's funny because when we were in the airport, I told my wife, I'm going to be the big gorilla. So... <laughs> <laughs> just popped in my head. Uh, according to organizational behavioral professional Deborah Grunfeld, powerful people sit sideways on chairs, drape their arms over the back, uh, or appropriate appropriate two chairs by placing an arm across the back of an adjacent chair. They put their feet on the desk and they sit on the desk. So when we were at the uh, academy together and we used to do the training over there in Courtney Hall. Yeah. I never realized I, it was by no means intentional, but I always put my arm around the chair next to me to, and took up more space. I really did it because I didn't want anybody to sit by me, but I always sit like that. I never noticed it. Um, uh, even in the movie theater, my wife will be on one side and I'll put my arm over the chair beside me to, if nobody's in it and sit like that too. Huh. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's about space. You're taking up more space. You're saying, Hey, I need this much space, right? Right. So it's kind of a. I never knew it was a big, uh, a big gorilla tactic, though, Brian. I, I'm. I was surprised to read that. <laughs> no, it's and it, it is kind of crazy. Yeah, I never, I never even thought about it. I'm be honest with you. I just kind of, I don't know. I thought it was a personal space preference thing. Maybe it was. Maybe it was the big gorilla thing. I mean, it's not always appropriate, but it it is something I just did without thinking about it. The author goes on to say the increased level of power people perceive you to have look for ways uh, to increase the level of power people perceive you to have look for ways to subtly increase the amount of space you you take up. So we're talking about draping the arm over the back of a chair or when a coworker comes in your office to chat instead of sitting behind your desk casually sit on top of it. I, I, I don't know. How do you feel about that Brian about somebody sitting on top of the desk when they talk to you? Uh, I, I, I don't know. That just kind of seems, uh, ah, that one's not so powerful to me. So one of the things I like to do instead, so I obviously have the chair behind the desk and then I have three other chairs in my room and there's two that are directly across from me and they're more, uh, I think they're a little classier than the other two chairs. Sometimes I'll actually, I'll let somebody come in and I'll have them sit down and I'll sit in the one beside them almost like how do I say this and not sound? I don't want to sound condescending at all to anyone, but it's almost like, here, let me sit with you because I'm one of you. You know what I mean? Like that feeling, even though this is my office, I want to be, you know, so it's kind of, I find that that's kind of a big gorilla power move, but who knows? Yeah, I think that is too. I th- I agree, bro. I think that's not a terrible idea either. Um, I don't know. It's something about the corner, sitting on the corner of the desk that just seems, a little too relaxed, I guess. If it depends, so I guess if a, you know, if uh, say one of my soldiers, uh, you know, I tell my soldier, "Hey, come to my office," and we're talking about something more personal. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe uh, you know, like here, say here, we get young soldiers and they live in the barracks. Maybe I'm bringing the soldier in to talk about the traveling opportunities and using NWR and stuff. So I can see where that's not too relaxed for a conversation like that. But it doesn't seem like big gorilla. Now, what it is for me, 
I, if I'm the other person, it actually feels like you're trying to intimidate me because you're trying to stand, sit over me. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting down, you're sitting up higher and you've gotten closer to me. To me, my perception is, I, I feel like it's intimidating. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I used, it tells me to get my space, but the other thing, so another tip that, uh, Cobain suggests to help us harness our inner big gorilla, and and this is tough here because they're not going to move, is to practice getting people to move aside for you in crowded environments using only your body language. So you imagine you're actually a big gorilla. Inflate up your chest, stand up straight, (laughs) start walking to see if people will move out of your way as you saunter in this powerful stance. Doing this might seem a bit uncomfortable and weird, but it's a great exercise to help you see the efficacy of body language. If you bump into someone, this is where I think it's key. If you bump into someone, treat it as an opportunity to convey warmth and kindness by apologizing and make the other person feel comfortable. Now, I can tell you here in in Europe, in their culture, one, they're not moving. And if you bump into somebody here, they're not even flinching, man. You know, in the States, if you bump into somebody, they may get a little uh, upset about it, might get an attitude about it. Here, it's so a norm uh, when you go to, like, crowded Christmas markets or when you're on the train or whatever. It's such a social norm here that they will literally just bounce off of you and keep it moving. You may not be able to show warmth by offering an apology here, Brian. Uh, I've done it. And again, I'm I'm a broader person from shoulder to shoulder, so I do require some space to get through, and people will just bump into me like I'm not even there. Uh, <laughs> and when I first got here, that was something we struggled with that. When I got here, I struggled with that whole idea of like, I know you see me. I know you see me. Uh but yeah, it's just a Europe. Everywhere we've been in Europe, like I've been to uh, like five, six different countries now, and all of them are the same in Europe, like that. It's just, it's so busy. Um, you know, on the train, there's no personal space. The, the you know, and I'm, I, I believe it's like that in Korea too. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. I was actually going to comment on that. Like it, like there's times that yeah. you're like, oh, come on, man, why do you? Hit? And it, sometimes like. I know how to, uh, I guess you could say, because you're going to go into the next thing about assuming, assuming a power pose, uh, but I know how to kind of keep my power base of my legs a certain way when I'm just standing there. And it it's funny when you see it, like one of the, because Koreans aren't really big. So when they run into you, it's almost like they just hit a wall and you see their face like, oh, 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 you know, and so... <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, it's the same way here, man. I, and I, but I can imagine Germans aren't, uh, they aren't the smallest of people too, some of them. So, Yeah, no. And it, like I said, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And sometimes, sometimes I feel bad because like, they don't move, I don't move. And then it's like a hockey hip check for them because, like, again, I'm not a littlest guy. And then I usually tell my wife, yeah, I hip check that one. <laughs> um, uh, and, and you just got to take that opportunity. Like I had told you earlier about the bus and they wouldn't let us off the bus in Rome. Uh, people would not move. Like, so I had already read this article. So at the next stop, I did the big gorilla. Uh, you know, I, as the, I told my wife, I said, just, I'm getting off at this next stop. Um, so the story is we were going to the Vatican city, uh, try to get off the bus at our bus stop. Nobody moves. We were maybe uh, maybe three seats from the front door, you know, standing and uh, tried to go through. Excuse me. Excuse me. Nobody moves. So at the next stop, I told my wife, hey, I'm getting off. And uh, so as as the stop bus is starting to slow to the stop, I did the I inflated up my chest, like stood up nice and tall, real squared my shoulders back. And I just went through like a running back coming through the hole of an of a line in football, um, and thinking my wife's <laughs> on my hip, but she wasn't. So I I literally I just pushed my way through. Like I didn't even turn sideways. Like I stayed square and just pushed through. Uh, and then two young kids get off the bus, <laughs> and I look behind me, and there's no wife. And so the kids get ready to get back on the bus, and I put my hands on him. I put my hand across his chest, and I said, hey, let my wife get off the bus first. And then I see her come off the middle of the bus, so I just say, hey, uh, you can get back on the bus. Sorry. 
I gave the apology, you know, and and that's where I practiced, uh, you know, last week's episode. Like I, direct, I I looked him right in the eye and was like, hey, you know, hey, sorry. And he got back on the bus. He said something to me. He probably cussed me out in Italian. But yeah, I had to use the big gorilla there. Uh, again, it's not always feasible. I feel like sometimes it's rude. I I feel like because of my size, sometimes I need to go the extra effort to get out of the way. Um, so I don't know how this big gorilla thing really and truly will work out for me. You know what I mean, Brian? Oh yeah, man. And you know, it's, uh, it's kind of funny that you, you say it that way too. Cause like here, if you, if, if I did that, if I put my hand on somebody, I actually get arrested for it. You can't, you can't physically touch someone like that. Like you can't hold them. You can't, it can't even be perceived because it could be, it, it could be considered like uh, like a sharp violation almost. I'm talking about on the outside, out on, on base and stuff. Uh, you have to be very careful of how you touch people, hmm. right? Yeah, so like well, that's one of those ones I have to be very cognizant of. Yeah, I may have. Well, so I can honestly, if we're being 100% honest, maybe I did the wrong thing. But when it comes to that, that lady that I'm married to, I wasn't letting her not get off the bus. So I was definitely willing to take that kind of a risk. You know what I mean? I may have been wrong too. It may have been something I could have gotten a lot of trouble for, but rather than let her go to some other bus stop, some random place in Italy. Yeah. I'll put my hands on. I, and I, I just put my hand across his chest. Like I didn't really like pound him or nothing, you know? So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, hey, but it, it wouldn't have mattered if I'd have gotten in trouble. I, they they didn't want to let us off the bus. I can't have her lost somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you know, I kind of noticed this. It in a in a when you were in a group of people too, even especially and this is like let's see, let's go back to uh, academy days too. One of the things that you used to do and and uh obviously Furman he continued doing I because I, I watched him do it once you were gone, was like when you bring new students into the uh the facilitator course how right off the bat you just you just throw something at them to you know, uh, to accomplish and they don't even know each other yet um and they all they see is ranks and stuff so sometimes you know the rank kind of takes a play but also how somebody presents who they are like standing there like the big gorilla i think come comes with it a little bit too also of like yeah that person you know or if they that person talks everyone listens if that makes sense right yeah, no, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I feel like that being the big gorilla can be more than, you know, puffing up your chest and bumping into people. Being the big gorilla can be your, you know, how you you conduct business, like for me in the classroom. How how do I enter that classroom, that first class? Because, again, you know, that's kind of setting the tone for the rest of those two, three weeks of, of courses. Um, the other thing is, and, and this is one that's kind of – kind of cool too so the next one which goes with being a big gorilla like i said is assume a power assume power poses it's related to the big gorilla these are body stances that have been proven to effectively convey power the most familiar power pose is arms akimbo with the hands resting on the waist this is superheroes are fond of this pose. So when you think about like Superman and he lands and he puts his hands on his hip with his arms out to his head, shoulder, you know, his arms bent out to his side, his elbows. And he's like, I'm here to defend truth, justice and dignity. Like that's the, the power pose that arms, you know, and it, to me, it's kind of, I don't know. It does take up more space, um, you know, going back to the big gorilla, but I have tried this. I'm uncomfortable. I, I've tried this uh, recently, um, so I guess I'm ahead of you on the uh, on the task for next week because I've already tried some of these things because this was my favorite part of the uh, the three part series. I really enjoyed this one. And then if you're at a meeting and you like to convey power to those in a room, simply stand up, lean forward, and rest your hands on the table in front of you, and it says "instant authority." <laughs> I don't know about that one, Brian. Uh, I attend a lot of meetings. I think I would get some weird looks if I just stood up, <laughs> lean forward, and rest my hands on the table in the min- middle of a meeting. You attend meetings, Brian. Uh, as the first time, what kind of message do you think that would convey for you? 
that well right off the bat they're going to think there's something wrong and they're about to get chewed out if i did it because of my position within the organization maybe i think that so this i think that falls in the line of understanding good emotional intelligence ed it really is Ooh. because let's say i'm not getting cooperation like i need if i need a good cooperation and and i'm getting pushback from my platoon starts maybe i stand up and do that and they're like, oh, he means business, right? I don't raise my voice yet. Mm. I'm just using, I'm escalating force in a sense. You know what I mean? So I think, I think I it like works, it. but you really have to understand emotional intelligence to be able to make that work. If you just do it all the time, people are like, oh, he's just standing up again. He's a loser. Yeah, no, I, I kind of, I like what you, you said there, though, because it does kind of give you that. I don't know. Let me, let me try it. I'm going to try it right now on the air. I'm going to try this pose and see how it feels. All right, here we go. Yeah, that feels, I don't know. It feels weird. If you were sitting across the other side of the desk from me, I imagine you would feel like I'm trying to hover over you. Maybe I just have an issue with being intimidated because I feel like it's very intimidating. But I, I can see in a meeting environment, if especially if you're, see, for you, the difference between you and I is you're usually going to be either the highest ranking or second highest ranking person in your meetings, right? Like a lot of times it's either it's you and your captain probably. Uh, for me, I'm usually uh, just – For the company meetings, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess I, I didn't think about you go to the battalion meetings too. So, um, yeah, just I don't know. Brigade. Oh, my, I'm sorry. Hot shot. Uh, i've avoided career. <laughs> yeah but for me i'm just i'm just another worker being in a room and a lot of mine are vtc uh meetings too so it would be even more strange to be on a video teleconference with like six different locations and i stand up and, <laughs> and lean forward but i can see where it would be like uh you know it would it would enhance your presence and, and show some uh i can see where it could show some power so there's one more pose I just oh go ahead. I I definitely think though that one it should it should be used with um a lot of tact and then a lot of like I said emotional intelligence. You have to know the situation and be like okay I'm about to use like it's kind of like it's like you're about to take away your kid's toy. Like when you take it, you better you better follow up with it or you're gonna get used and abused. You know what I mean? So you have to be very careful with it. I think. Yeah. Well, so it's funny you said be very careful because in this next pose, the author even says they're not sure when you could incorporate this pose in your daily life without looking weird. It's called. Um, it's the pose where you lift your arm straight up in the air like you've just thrown the game winning touchdown pass. So when you think about this one, this is what I want you to think about. And, and it's in there. They're showing a picture of him uh, doing it in the article. Usain um, Bolt, right, when he wins the gold medal and he comes across the line, he throws his arms up in the air almost like a V above his head immediately, right? That's this pose. So that would be kind of weird. Uh, that would be kind of a weird pose like in a meeting, right? <laughs> Just randomly throw your arms up in the air. Yes. Uh, and, and that's what the author says, though. But it does. It is a powerful pose. You, do you know the pose I'm talking about, Brian? I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I can see what you're talking about there. But I would definitely say it's just like the last one. You have to use it at certain times. Like, personally, I think that works well, like right after like something's going on uh, at physical training, you know, PRT yes. or whatever. That's a really good time to use it because it's kind of I like to use it to show embrace too. like uh, if I'm talking in front of the formation, for instance, and I am speaking about how we have to take care of each other. I open my arms up as if I'm embracing the formation, showing them. And I, when I open it up, I'd say, for instance, you're my family. And if I open my arms up, like I'm hugging them and I'm saying they are my family, they feel embraced and they feel like I'm the father figure possibly. Mm. Um, I tell my commander, he gets to be the mother figure. I'm the dad. So <laughs> now, uh, but that's, that's just one of those things. I think that works in certain situations. Now in a meeting situation, I think it's when we come with a eureka moment. Like, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. You know what I mean? Like there has to be certain emphasis and it has to be with a certain goal in mind. And then they're achieving that goal and you're you're showing excitement for it. But to me, once again, it's not something you use all the time. Yeah, I think there's an appropriate time because, you know, at the same time, this, this pose to me, 
could also convey some sarcasm. So I've been waiting on something for a while. We finally accomplished this thing and I throw my arms up and I could also be saying, well, it's about time or, you know, you know, thank the Lord. It finally happened. You know what I mean? Like, so it could mean, but in the, I think in a physical environment, physical fitness environment, this is actually a, a great pose for something, you know, Oh, I just got my best run time ever on the, you know, army physical fitness test throw those arms up afterwards, like celebrate that, that, that great accomplishment. So I, yeah, I can see that. I can tell you that for me, physical fitness wise. So the Superman pose, uh, the, the superhero pose, that's one I've been rehearsing because in the article, it says what's interesting about all these different poses is that not only do they make others perceive you as more powerful, but they also make you feel more powerful. Studies have shown that by simply standing in a power pose for two minutes, testosterone levels increase while cortisol levels decrease, making you feel more confident and less stressed. So in the gym, uh, I will stand with the hands on the hip kind of pose every once in a while and in between sets. One, I'm trying to get my breath and I'm trying to stand up nice and tall and get, you know, get some good breathing in. But at the same time, after reading this article, so for the past week, uh, week and a half, I've been trying this too to see how it feels as far as comp. That's why I say it's kind of weird. I don't know that I would stand that way in a meeting, um, but then I break the rules. So I like to cross my arms in front of my chest and everybody says, well, that's closed. That means you're closed off, but it doesn't for me. Um, and for some reason, I think it's hereditary because my brother stands like that. My father stands like that. My sister But that's one of my most comfortable positions in a meeting is to cross my arms in front of my chest. Yeah, I would call I wouldn't quite call it hereditary. I would probably call it more like a learnt trait that you you're mimicking somebody who's influenced you in life. Well, we're all mimicking that guy, the the old guy who just had his birthday, by the way. But yeah, we're we're mimicking the old guy. Uh, So yeah, I'm going to continue when we do the task this week. I'm going to continue to Superman pose in the uh, in the gym and see, you know. Uh, what I can come up with for the ne- for the next show when we discuss some of the things we went over today. So that, my friend, takes care of. We just talk- yeah. So we just went over be the big gorilla, and we also talked about assume power poses, Brian. So would you take us to our next topic on how to show charisma through power? All right. So taking control of your environment. I can tell you this happened with me last week. So I, this has already happened. Uh, I've, I was sitting in a meeting, uh, lots of majors, some captains, a couple of LTs here and there, and a bunch of Sergeant First Classes and Master Sergeants. And they were basically deciphering some things and they were figuring some stuff out. And I kind of got tired of what I was hearing at the moment. And I was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. And like, <laughs> I, you know, I just went straight into First Sergeant mode because it is my task to get things, certain things straight here in the company. And I felt myself taking control of that environment. I really did. Like, and everyone, it was almost like no one talked. Everyone paid attention to me. And I sat in a powerful pose in a sense on the, at the table. Like, so my arms, I, I definitely had like a, a wide stance with my legs. I'm sitting in the chair, wide stance with my legs. And my elbows are on the table. My hands are up kind of like just moving my hands every once in a while a little bit, but kind of uh, like my hands are kind of touching each other, almost like a triangle. And I'm talking about what we will do. And it wasn't like there was like, well, we can't do that. No, it was like, yes, we will do that. You know what I mean? Like, so it kind of, it was almost like I was influencing them of what would yeah. happen. Um, but with that, and, and you've probably done it too, Ed. I know you have. <laughs> yeah, where you just had enough of the indecisiveness and you just say, okay, uh, I get that when my family gets together. We, you know, sometimes uh, one of us will say, all right, that's, we're, we're doing too much of, well, do you want to? And then somebody just has to take charge. My wife is usually the one that takes charge because uh, I relegate that role to her. Hey, make a decision for us. But yeah, yeah, that's all that is, is, uh, you know, you get tired of hearing <laughs> going around and around and around. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, well, last week we were talking about doing a trunk or treat as a section. And, and our lieutenant colonel was like, hey, that'd be an awesome idea. Do y'all want to do it? And then that turned into, well, do you want to do it? Well, do you want to do it? So finally, we got her to just say, all right, we're going to, we got a van. We're going to do it. Now we just need to make participation a voluntary thing. Uh, And one of my peers said, 
went and typed up, you know, a spreadsheet and pretty much made it not volunteer. She just sent out names and said, you'll do decorations, you'll do costumes, you'll do candy. Um, and it worked out. It did work out. Not not the preferred method, but it did work out because that's she got tired of listeners go round and round and round. So once the lieutenant colonel said, hey, we're mm-hmm. going to put in in a uh, entry, the other sergeant first class, like, okay, well, we're not we're not messing around no more. Like she literally tasked one of the other captains to bring their bunny rabbit that they have. And, and I'm tasked with bringing the general Patton with me. <laughs> so, but it, it was, a, but it was <laughs> that's what it, man. Yeah. Hey, that's how you take it over. Yeah. She just got tired of listening to it and she's like, all right, yeah. I'll take this. So yeah, it's, 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 and I've never done a trunk or treat yeah. in my entire career until now, by the way. <laughs> So we we kind of said what it was, but I want to I kind of I want to set the scene so people kind of understand what we meant by that because th- I think they really give a good uh, they give a good basically they draw a good picture uh, um, a word picture for people. So here we go. We feel most self assured, at ease, and powerful when we're familiar with our surroundings. Familiarity gives us a sense of control, which makes us feel confident. This is why organizations sometimes fight over the location of negotiations before they even start negotiating. Each side wants the home field advantage. But how can you be familiar with a room if it's your first time entering it? Author and magician Stephen Cohen suggests doing small things to instantly take control of your surroundings. For example, when you sit down at a table in a restaurant, rearrange things on the table. Move a salt shaker or your water glass. It sounds silly, but by doing this, you tell your subconscious that you have control, even if it's nominal, of your surroundings, which in turn makes you more confident and magnetic. Look for small but polite ways in which you can take control of your surroundings in your everyday activities. You might be amazed by the results. So what I really explained there was when you're entering someplace you've never been before, you need to get control of the environment. But then once you have that control environment and how Ed and I explained it is like we we elevated that control to another level by taking control of, say, the conversation or taking control of how things are going. Uh, I And I think I truly believe, though, if if you're walking into and it's, I find this. Uh, I watch people. I'm a people watcher. I know you are too, Ed, because we've talked about it. Yes. I, I watch people and I watch how they enter rooms. I really do. I watch how they try to mingle with people. I watch people um, as they try to initiate uh, what they want to say. So one of the things that I often look for, first thing, is like when somebody enters the room, are they confident of where they're going to go sit? That's me, first thing. Because I, I know, so in the arm, it's a little bit different. Um uh, we we usually have placards, so it tells us where we can sit. But what if there are none? You know, where do people sit? I also like to watch and see. All right, are certain people only talking to people with, that they work with, or are they actually venturing out and they're creating relationships? Like those are the things that I find uh, key because I'm really big into that crosstalk. Mm-hmm. I love crosstalk across shops. I mean, obviously, there's certain things that you can't talk about, but. To me, that also sets that whole controlling the environment because what they're doing is they're engaging with others and they're they're, they're either learning about something or they're understanding something new um, that's not within their little realm. And that kind of helps them understand others within that area. You know, so I like to I personally before meeting, I think they're plenty early enough to where I can mingle a little bit and talk to people and kind of just, you know, hubbub a minute and see what's going on. Uh, but, yeah, it's. That's the way I see it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Ed? Yeah, so a great example for me was I, I was in Sweden for a conference, and we had a uh, 1800 icebreaker is what was on the schedule, you know, 6 p.m. So I was like, that's kind of odd. Like, that's that's pretty late. Well, what it was is the Swedes want to have a social before they start any kind of conference. So basically what we did is we went there. They had sp- spreads of food, coffee. Uh, they had beer, they had wine and, um, they gave like one complimentary beer or wine, whichever you wanted. And then you were supposed to kind of mingle. Well, we all know what happens, right? So you're talking about, we're talking about various countries. Everybody's going to go with their own little clique of people. And that's who you're going to talk to. 
Well, the logistics are the uh, Swedish quartermaster that put it all together. She comes over to us as we were entering, and she goes, oh, you guys are from you know the U.S. And we're like, yeah. And she says, okay, well, here's here's the rules. You get one beer or one wine. I was like, awesome. And she says, and then you go talk to somebody who did not travel here with you. And you continue to do this. And I should not see you talking only to Americans. So I I thought it was interesting. And we did. We went. We talked to, like, um, you know, some Finnish folks, uh, soldiers, some Swedish soldiers. And you really set the tone for the conference because when they break down a conference, they're going to put us in a logistics um, cell to work together. But it's not just the American logistics people. It's everybody, right? Right. So that was interesting how the Swedes do that. And and uh, my understanding is anytime they host any kind of conference or whatever, that's what they do. They have an icebreaker the night prior to the actual start, and they encourage you not to talk to the people that you know. They do an introduction so you know, all right, that's going to be the lead for my particular cell. That's who I need to go get with and let talk to them. And when you go talk to them, the Swedes will, you know, uh, the Swedish people will actually most of the uh, people from that part, that region, they'll tell you like, no, no, no. Tonight's not about business. They're just there to talk and get to know you. Oh, where's your family from? Da, da, da. Like, it's, so it was a very social event. It was very interesting. It was awesome. Um, and you can see how they enter the room and how they conduct themselves. It was I wish I'd have read this article before because I'd have probably made some really good observations then. But but. It'll also play into our next role, uh, next uh, topic when we get to it, Brian. Absolutely. You want to get us to it? Oh, are we ready? I, I'm ready. All right. Hey, when you're talking to these folks, uh, uh, right? So I'm, I'm talking to people. Well, one of the ways that I convey my charisma through power is to speak less and slowly. Powerful people don't just take up space physically. They also take up space in conversation. Paradoxically. This doesn't mean you should be hogging the speaking time. Powerful people actually tend to speak less than low status individuals. By making their words uh, scarce, powerful people increase the value of their communication. When they do speak, people listen. Harness your inner Spartan. I love that part. By being a bit less chatty and a bit more laconic with your speech. Hmm. Sounds good to me. So this is like... Really making you which when you do speak, make it valuable. You know what I mean? Like make it something they want to hear. If, if you know, we've we've talked to many times about uh people o- talking too much and you know, close your mouth and you'll know t- twice as much, you'll know what you know, and you'll know what the speaker knows. Um, so that's one of those things, and then and then speak slowly. So for me, because I'm dealing with people from other nations. I have no choice. I have to speak slower because maybe their English isn't great. And then they'll do, you'll notice they do the same thing because they, they, their English is not uh, great. So they'll speak slower to make sure I understand what they're trying to convey as well. Um, And I can tell you, since I've been in Europe, one of my favorite parts of this job is when I get to deal with other countries, I love interacting with people from the different nations, uh, because it's interesting to watch how they communicate. And and going back, they do the head nod. You know what I mean? They do the, oh, I understand. They, they at least let you, con- you know, they convey that message. So, and in this conference environment, it was very important, mm-hmm. uh, I thought. But I never thought of speaking less and slowly as a way to show power. It's interesting. Yeah, I this, one, this is one of those ones where I, I kind of, <clears throat> I've kind of figured but I didn't know that that's like what they were getting at, what you get after. And I mean, like I try to use it like, so when we're talking about speaking less, uh, I, I, I convey this as listen to what everyone has to say before you make decisions. You know, that told that whole, you know, we've talked about it. You've got two ears, one mouth. So listen more, talk less. I, I totally, totally believe in that. I have. And the slowly part, and, <laughs> So I don't want to, it's not like talking yeah, I, really yeah. slow because then somebody may be like, okay, there's something wrong with this dude. But I have, it's hard. Like if you get in front of a large group of people, I can tell you like there's been a few times in my, in my, in my life where I've had, I've had to speak with, to a large number, thousands of people for a, a thousand or so people. Uh, w- one would be like mm. in front of church, you know, and, and do like speak about something or especially the congregation I was a part of or speaking to a large number of soldiers. 
you get excited, right? Um, even to speak in somebody who you may think is important, you get excited and it's almost like you don't know what to say and you're like, blah, 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 you know, you're just going off. It's knowing like, and you can feel it. And the reason I say this, cause you can feel, it's almost like, a, um, uh, you, you feel your chest pounding a little bit harder. You, you know, you're starting, maybe you're sweating a little bit. Maybe your palms getting sweaty or something. Uh, and then obviously you dump mom spaghetti on your, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that's no. totally <laughs> but, <laughs> but you, you can notice that like, there's something going, like your adrenaline's up or something's going on. That's to me, that's where you are listening and you'll feel it and you breathe. And you just breathe. And that's that mindfulness that we've talked about a hundred times, Ed. I mean, ever since we really did that episode with Doc Holtz, and then we've talked about it multiple times during these two shows so far. But mindfulness of knowing, okay, I'm going to probably have to speak. I've got to control who I am first. And it really helps. I think it helps to uh, to kind of convey the message that is meaningful, if that makes sense. Matter of fact, so <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Friday morning, was it Friday morning? No, we were off on Friday. So Thursday morning, uh, we had conducted a, a company PRT session because we're doing that like every other week. Uh, like the whole company does it together. It's pretty fun. Um, and I looked at the commander before and I said, Hey, you want to, let's just do the safety brief right after. And then they, their sections can release them, you know, when they're done for the day type thing. He's like, Oh yeah, no problem. And normally I'll take the helm first and then hand it over to him. Cause he's the commander. <laughs> I, you know, I give this speech and I really get, I mean, I, cause I, you know, me Ed, I like to put a lot of emotion and stuff and I really, you know, talk it up and talk about taking care of each other and doing the right thing and all that stuff. And I get done and I look over to the commander and say, hey, you got anything, sir? He's like, no, I can't follow that up. I guess we're done. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a, it was definitely motivational, but yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I speak less and slowly. So where you look at the speak less and slowly too in here. And he talks about in the article, but without just reading the article, he's really talking about how you're trying. So you're trying to fill space because you don't want awkward silence. So you speak so much. This is a tactic I've always used with soldiers, because if you let that soldier go and they get to talking and you don't slow them down, they may say something that you need that's key without meaning to, because they're trying to fill up that awkward silence. You know what I mean? Like they may reveal why they're really late or why they made the decision they made or whatever it is. And, and for us as leaders, that's fine. You're helping us. But when you're in an environment like that conference, you don't want to speak so fast because it really, um, according to the author, it conveys a message that I'm speaking quickly to get my message out. Because if I don't say it fast, you're not going to listen to me. And that's where that power, that's where we get back to power now. So when I take my time and I'm speaking to you, one, I'm showing my intellect uh, and conveying that to you, but I'm also showing you that I'm not worried about you ignoring me because I know that you're going to listen to me. So I give that slower rate of speech and, and that's the message I'm sending. And that's where the power piece comes from in this one, Brian. Uh, and that's a, that's an important one too. I'm going to try this in a meeting this week. Bam. I just committed to two already for the uh, for the task this week, my friend. You are way behind now. <laughs> hey, brother, I, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to try a lot of this this week, and I'm going to do it strategically. Ooh. So <laughs> I, I just threw that in there. Strategically. Yeah. Uh, so let, well, let's move on to this last one because I, I think – this is just me, Ed – I really believe this boost your uh, boost your poise is very much what we try to instill in instructors. Actually, so when when I start reading this, you're gonna be like, "Oh yeah," it's, and you already read it probably. So you're gonna be like, "Yeah, of course." Um, this is exactly what we try to do. But to me, I think this is about image. It really is. It's about your image of how you convey your who you are, and it helps and uh, to really boost that whole power thing by having good poise. All right. So powerful people are composed people. They have poise or a certain grace and stillness about them. They don't excessively nod, which is a sign of submissiveness. Hmm. They don't fidget, a sign of nervousness. And they don't rely on verbal fillers like um and ah. Uh. Wow. In your next encounter with someone, act natural, but focus on being as still as possible. Nod every now and then to indicate you're listening, but don't turn into a bobblehead. 
Keep your hands still and don't tap your feet. Read our article on how to eliminate ums and uhs. And I'll make sure that I, I uh, put that in there. But I can tell you, that can be one of the toughest things that anybody can do. We we actually, were, we would train soldiers by counting how many ums and uhs and all rights and all these different things. I, I definitely can tell you that we've even said it throughout this show. It's still a bad habit. But once you kind of learn how to... M- watch what you're saying in a sense by listening to yourself a little bit you kind of have that in you to be able to nix that from your uh, whole verbal uh see i almost did it right there (laughs) through whatever verbal communication you have with others right but i mean when you read that ed does that not remind you of how we would critique or get instructors to become better well it is and it's one of the reasons we would tell them when we talked about their crutch words or what have you It's one of the things we would tell them is because it shows a lack of poise and it also conveys a lack of rehearsal and familiarity with the materials. And that's when they go to those fillers like, um, and, uh, which the, the, so counting those is also a curse because we did it so much when we were at the Academy. I cannot attend a meeting without noticing if somebody is excessively using um and us. And then I start counting them. I, I just can't, I cannot break that habit. It's like terrible. Oh yeah. I, I find myself, there's times when I listen to certain people and, and I, I think I mentioned it. I mentioned it before last episode about Elon Musk, but I, I like his ideas. I like some of the stuff he does, but I really can't listen to him do a presentation about another car or another <laughs> solar panel that goes on your roof or the power packs in the house because he says, um, so much like it literally annoys me to the point where I'm like, I can't focus on the actual content of it. And maybe that's just, maybe I'm being kind of single minded in that, but it's just one of those things that I've kind of, I push to the side. Yeah. Well, I don't think you're being single minded, but yeah, it's I I have difficulty listening to it. And it's it came from the academy before the academy, I really didn't pay attention to stuff like that. But I guarantee if you open my green notebook right now on my meeting notes, because I have it divided by whatever different meeting I have to go to, you will see counts at some point. And it'll be low key. Like I'll put Captain, you know, Z. I won't put names. <laughs> captain l just i know who it is and i just count them i it's i can't help it it's a terrible habit <laughs> yeah that's one of those things man but it does show a lack of poise yeah. right it shows a lack of poise i've even talked to one of my captains who briefs a lot and he briefs the you know the two-star general in our command frequently and i'm like you got to rehearse or at least read the script have some kind of a script because he goes in there and you're briefing this two star and you're going uh um so and and i'm trying to break him of that he's gotten better because last time we did like a uh a a brief to the general i was like that was that was terrible you brief for five minutes you said uh and um 60 times that's terrible (laughs) like so I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. I am working on it. I just said so. Absolutely. I'm working on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do a lot in the show. I usually just cut them out. <laughs> oh, well, I thank you, my friend. No, just... Yeah. All right. So we talked about this, <laughs> all this different stuff. There it is. I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> exactly. All right. So. <laughs> yeah. We just talked about these nine elements to help you boost your power within your charisma, so to speak, right? And they go with boost your confidence, know a little about a lot, become physically fit, dress for power, be the big gorilla, assume power poses, take control of your environment, speak less and slowly, and boost your poise. We want you to take one to two of those. You can do more if you like, but that's this this episode, episode 46 task, is to take one to two of those and work on it. And let us know when you're in the closed Facebook group, which you can find at 101 Influence on Facebook. You type that in your search bar, go to that page and hit visit group, answer three questions that we ask you. And then once that comes through to either Ed, myself, his wife or my wife, one of us will approve it as long as there's nothing vulgar or anything in it. But... <laughs> 
then go in there and let us know. If this is your first time listening, hey, come in there. Come give us some of your your knowledge. You know, help us become smarter and help us boost our confidence in knowing a little bit about a, you know something else. With that, do that. Go in, let us know what you think or what you try to do for this particular week. But give yourself at least a week, if not two weeks, and then go back and then go in. Maybe give yourself a month. It doesn't matter as long as you try it. That's the thing. We're about offering up some suggestions. Ed and I are far from professionals or or the type of people who know everything. All we're saying is we're doing the research. We want to talk about it. And then we want to share that information with you all so you can try to make yourself a little bit better and become a better influencer. That's that's my whole thing on it. I would also tell you, if you want to check out The Charisma Myth, it's a great book. I've got it. Ed's got it. Uh, yeah. And you can find it in, uh, on Amazon. Uh, one of the things uh, we've we have been talking about, obviously, by the time this show airs, most likely we'll have already recorded episode fifty. Most likely, we'll see what happens. Just I want to prepare you for this, and one of the reasons, one of the ways I wanted to prepare you, I want to read something I just received today. Just today, I was in the gym, I was getting after it, and my phone goes off. And sometimes, if I'm in a breather, I'll check we'll see what it is, or if I'm in a, during a rest break where I'm not doing anything, I'll pick it up and check it out. But this is what a young man wrote to me today, and this really, I mean, I didn't work that much with him, really. If you think about it, I got here to Korea. We were here for a few months together, and then he left. But this is what he wrote. It says, Top, I decided to give your podcast a try during my workout. I just wanted to let you know I loved it and I'm hooked. Big fan, especially the most recent one about burnout. That right there, I mean, Ed, I don't know how you feel about what we are been doing. We have done throughout this. I mean, we're on 46 right now. We're about to get we're about to hit that big 50 mark. When I see stuff like that, just one person. If I've if I've influenced or changed one person by something I've said or done or whatever, that means a lot to me. And that's the thing. We're going to share a couple more during episode 50, Ed and I. He's got one that's from somebody who means a yeah. great deal to him. I've got another one. Not only this, I, I mean, this means a lot to me. It really does. And that's why I want to share it. But I've got one that means a lot to me also from a guy that uh, I tried to help mentor a little bit uh, earlier on in the career. Uh, but... These are these that I mean that right there. That's what it's all about. It really is. What do you think, Ed? Yeah. So one, just one. We just need one person that we influence. So just like that young man, just like uh, mine from Old Huey, uh, those things make it worth it. Um, I'm, we're not in it for monetary gain. We're not in it for any of that. Like I'm not in it for my ego. Uh, you know what I mean? Like I'm in it because. It's a way to help people, and we we're, I think we're doing a great job, Brian. We're coming up on this first year. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's excellent. I like those things. I, I mean, I, even if the Q&A show is nothing but reading stuff like that from people, I would be okay with that. Absolutely, man. Well, with that, I we've really – this one's we've pushed to the limit, brother. This is probably one of our longer episodes, and I it's going to take me a hot minute to edit. Uh, not really edit. It's not that much. It's just I like to listen to the entire thing, make sure everything meshes up properly. Uh, but do you have anything else for the audience before we uh, close this one down, my friend? No, I think we're good. I would – like, again, we don't get anything from Amazon, but I would highly recommend the book, The, uh, the Charisma Myth. It is really uh, – it's really good. I'm, I'm enjoying it, and I'm hoping that uh, it's going to help me improve my charisma. <laughs> That's it, man. So with that, I am Brian. And I am Ed. And this has been the Instinctive Influencers Podcast. We thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. That was, that was power. <laughs>